Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video. And today I'm going to be doing my November wrap up and telling you about all the things that I read in the month of November. So I will start off as I usually do with the classics um, and one book that I read in November was David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. I wasn't reading this copy, I was listening to the audiobook narrated by Richard Armitage. David Copperfield was the October and November pick for the mega Dickens read-along. I will link more information down below about that and I will have a video just all about David Copperfield up in the next few weeks as well. Um, but I really enjoyed rereading David Copperfield. It's been a little while since I last read it and I do think it is a fantastic book. So this is a buildings roman following the character of David Copperfield from literally his birth until he is in his um late 20s I guess um and we're basically following his life his experiences um his kind of movements about in class his search for a home for an identity his boyhood his education his family relationships his courtships later and it's all about his life and all the people he meets along the way there is a lot that I really love in David Copperfield it is beautifully written um it is a really accessible Dickens book I like I think it's a good place to start with Dickens and there are some truly truly wonderful characters in it especially Tommy Traddles who is my personal favourite from David Copperfield. There are a couple of things that I slightly struggle with in it, especially the depiction of a couple of the female characters later on, where I feel like Dickens is trying to do some complicated interesting things that he doesn't quite achieve, um, but I don't know. I'm gonna make a whole video about David Copperfield with a lot more thoughts on that, so I'll save most of my thoughts for that. I feel like the last time I read David Copperfield I was like this has shot up in my estimation, and now reading it I'm like no this kind of maybe still belongs in the middle of my Dickens love, but anyway. The rest of my reading for November kind of broadly falls into three categories. Um, so I was sort of participating in non-fiction November, by which I mean I made a TBR video and I read three things, two of which I had started already, one of which turned out to be only half non-fiction. So I didn't do very well for non-fiction November this year, but ended up just having other things I was prioritising this November, which is fine. Um, so one thing that I did finally finish for non-fiction November was this. This is Sketches by Boz by Charles Dickens, so another Dickens book. So Sketches by Boz is something that I thought was entirely non-fiction because I had started it and the beginning is non-fiction but it's not entirely non-fiction at all. Sketches by Boz is basically a collection of Dickens's magazine articles, some of which are sort of like narrative non-fiction observations and some of which are short stories. The back of my edition says it is um, a rich and strange mix of reportage, observation, fancy and fiction centred on the metropolis, um, which sounds about right. I found this a weird read because I love Dickens so much and I love his writing but basically I really enjoyed all the fiction <laughs> I didn't really enjoy the non-fiction stuff very much like I found a lot of the kind of creative non-fiction pieces just sort of not that interesting like I feel like they would be interesting if I were doing historical research on the specific topic they were talking about but I feel like I wasn't kind of interested in just reading them as a reader however I did enjoy quite a lot of the short stories in the tales section um so not really a successful non-fiction November but yeah, I'm glad that I finally finished this having been meaning to finish it for ages you know I've read all of Dickens's novels like many many times but I hadn't read this so it was good to read this um, and yeah a bit of a mixed bag I suppose. Then also for non-fiction November I finished um, The Secret Diaries of Anne Lister volume 2 No Priest But Love which I'd started before but I hadn't finished. Um, I read volume 1 earlier this year and found it absolutely fascinating and so I've been wanting to pick up the second volume which is also really really interesting. I've tapped lots of things, um, made lots of notes, found this a really really interesting read. If you don't know who Anne Lister was she was an upper class woman living in in the early 19th century um, who kept coded diaries about her life um, documenting her everyday life but also her romantic and sexual relationships with women and many many years down the line some of her diary entries have been decoded um, and edited into volumes and published um, so there's the first volume which I read earlier this year and then this is the second volume so this volume just covers the years of Anne's life from 1824 to 1826 and um, so it doesn't go up to the end of her life. She died in 1841, which I kind of think I was hoping it would have done. I think the diaries from her later life have not been like as fully decoded, but I found this just a really, really interesting read and Anne's like emotional life is just really there on the page. This is sort of historically fascinating, but also kind of emotionally fascinating, I guess. I will say that I feel like the first volume of Anne Lissa's diaries is more interesting. Um, partly just because it spans a much longer period of time so you sort of get more of a sense of Anne growing up as a person um, but 
I would kind of say overall I feel like I would really really recommend reading the first volume of Alice's Diaries but I don't feel like it's as necessary to read the second volume as well like I feel like a lot of what I got out of the second volume I had kind of already got out of the first I don't know I still found it a really really interesting read really glad I read it but I would like especially recommend the first volume rather than especially recommending them both if that makes sense then I also read this book this is Rooms of Their Own Where Great Writers Write by Alex Johnson um so this is a kind of like more heavily illustrated um non-fiction which is basically all about um where writers write like the places that they write um, and also quite a lot about their writing routines actually which I wasn't necessarily expecting from the title it's really really beautiful really really nicely designed and it was a very quick read like, I enjoyed this I thought it had some interesting fun anecdotes in I do feel like it's probably the kind of book that you're meant to like flick through rather than sit down and read it all in one go like I feel like it was probably a little bit repetitive to sit down and read all in one go um but I think that's just the kind of book it is and I just read it in the way that it wasn't really intended to be read and it was interesting to read about different like writing routines and different like writing locations and writing habits of various writers so yeah it was an interesting read good fun one to pick up then the next three books I want to talk to you about are all works of historical fiction they're all relatively recent releases and I listened to them all on audiobook um, and these three books were books that were on the HWA debut crown shortlist so the HWA are the Historical Writers Association um, and every year they have a few book prizes the gold crown which is for historical fiction in general the debut crown which is for debut historical fiction and the non-fiction crown which is for non-fiction history books and my novel The Secrets of Hartwood Hall was on the debut crown shortlist which was a very big surprise to me I was very very surprised to make the long list and I was exceptionally surprised to make the shortlist um but that was very exciting so the shortlist had six books on it and um, I'd read one of them already well two of them obviously I had read my own book um I'd read another one of the books already um The Secret Diaries of Charles Ignatius Sancho by Patterson Joseph which was the book that ultimately won um which I read earlier this year I think it was this year yeah and I really really loved but then I hadn't read the other four books on the shortlist but so I thought I would try and read them in November before the awards ceremony which I went along to and was really good fun and um, I didn't end up reading one of them which was Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmis but I feel like enough people have read Lessons in Chemistry that there isn't really like a hurry for me to read it I'll read it at some point but I did want to read the other three because I have been meaning to read all of them for a while so let me talk about them after that big preamble so first I read Death and the Conjurer by Tom Mead this is a golden age set murder mystery um so set in the 1930s and towards the beginning of the book a psychiatrist is found murdered in a locked room and the police not really knowing how to solve this call upon the assistance of a conjurer a magician to help them work out how this crime could have possibly happened meanwhile on the very same night that the murder occurs um a theft also occurs from a locked room um and so we have kind of two locked room mysteries going on side by side i really enjoyed this this is a great fun really well plotted locked room mystery with lots of twists and turns and some very very good twists one twist especially i thought was really 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 well done and in general i just thought it was a great read it's also pretty short as well like it was a very quick listen i think i listened to it basically entirely in one day while doing some baking um, and it was just a very enjoyable experience so i highly recommend death in the conjurer then next i listened to clytemnest by Costanza Cassati which was really fantastic very very well written um really really impactful Clytemnestra is a Greek myth retelling um retelling the story of Clytemnestra and her life um it's definitely one of the Greek myth retellings that is on the realism side like there's no magic there's no gods in here or at least there's religion but there's not sort of gods as active participants um in the way that there are in books like Circe which is the only other Greek myth retelling I have read um and I much prefer this style of Greek myth retelling I would say um like I feel like I got a lot more out of Clytemnestra than I got out of Circe um I just think I like the fully historical myth retellings more than the like magic realism side of things and I also feel like Costanza does some really clever things with like the way she interprets the magical elements of Greek mythology so for example obviously in Greek mythology there are people who are said to be like half god um like their father is zeus and their mother is a mortal woman kind of thing and there's one bit in clytemnestra where clytemnestra says to her sister oh that's just what people say when they don't know who one of your parents are like it's almost a way for the upper classes to make illegitimacy like more respectable and there's just a few like really clever things like that um that i think work really really well in general i just think clytemnestra is a fantastic book it follows clytemnestra over a lot of years of her life so the book must span like um 
at least 25 years, I would have said, probably more. And we follow Clytemnestra throughout her life and through all the awful, awful things that happen to her. It is a very, very dark book, very, very raw and very powerful, but also Clytemnestra is such a good character and the characterization in general is just so amazing. I do find it quite interesting when I read Greek myth retellings, which as I've already established, not very often because I didn't know this story. Like there were a couple of things that I was like, oh, this is vaguely familiar to me, but mostly I didn't know any of the story. So I didn't know what was gonna happen. Whereas I feel like if you know a lot more about Clytemnestra as a mythological figure, you probably will know some of the story beats that this hits. And I feel like it must be a very different experience because there must be a, like a very different sense of dramatic irony when you know what's going to happen. Whereas throughout this, I just didn't. In general, I just thought Clytemnestra was fantastic. Um, and it's been really nice to read and enjoy because I feel like because I liked Cersei, but didn't love Cersei, and I didn't really know why I didn't love Cersei because I thought it was a great book. Like it was really well written, but I just didn't quite click with it. And so it's really nice to have read Clytemnestra and be like, actually, there are Greek myth retellings I will enjoy, but it's the realistic ones. Um, and then I've got The Heroines by Laura Shepperson on my shelf as well, which I'm really excited to read because that's in a similar vein, I think. Um, and yeah, I just thought Clytemnestra was fantastic. Like the writing was just absolutely amazing. So highly recommend that one. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention that the audiobook of Clytemnestra was um, read by Olivia Vinnell, who also read my audiobook of The Secrets of Howard Hall. So it was really nice to listen to another audiobook narrated by her because she has such a great voice. And then the last one I read from the HWA shortlist was um, The Circus Train by Amita Parikh. This novel is set chiefly in the 1930s and 40s and it is mostly the coming of age story of a girl called Lena. Lena has grown up on a circus train, um, a train that travels around around Europe, um, putting on circus performances to audiences wherever they go. She lives with her father um, and the rest of the circus performers, but she in general has felt quite lonely through a lot of her childhood. Her mother died when she was born. Lena herself had polio when she was very young, um, has often struggled with her health. She uses a wheelchair and she feels like that distances herself from a lot of the other children on the circus train. And then at the beginning of the book, a new boy, Alexander, arrives on the train and he and Lena become friends and this friendship kind of changes the course of Lena's life um, forever, I suppose. And the book follows Lena and Alexander as they grow up, as war begins to change Europe and as their relationship begins to change. And the book kind of takes a fairly dramatic turn halfway through. I kind of don't want to say more than that, but I feel like the book wasn't exactly what I was expecting it to be. And the second half was like even more powerful than the first. I think it's a really, really great book. I feel like you will like The Circus Train if you liked The Whalebone Theatre by Joanna Quinn. I feel like they have some kind of similar elements um, in that they're both kind of like World War II stories that start quite a long way before World War II and kind of build up to it and they both look are kind of like coming of age stories and have some really interesting character relationships in them. I don't know, I feel like they reminded me of each other. Um, and The Circus Train was just really, really powerful with some wonderful moments in. So that's another book I would definitely recommend um, and the audiobook was really great as well. Then the next um, six books that I read in November are all books that are coming out in the first half of 2024. So they're all um, advanced proof copies that I've been sent um, and I have been really behind on my proofs for ages um, and hadn't read any of the proofs I've been sent for a long time so I decided in November I was going to read all the proofs I had been sent which I did which was great. Um, I did a vlog of this where I spoke about all these books in a lot more detail so I'm not going to talk too much about them here because I feel like this video is already quite long even though I haven't talked about that many books um, but you know let me tell you about these six books because they're all really really great. I really recommend them all when they come out in 2024. I really enjoyed all of them. Um, so I'll start off with the only one that isn't historical and that's this. This is nothing serious by Emma Madrano. So this book is the story of Nikki and Amber. Nikki is in her 30s, Amber is a 17 year old girl. Both of these people are struggling quite a lot with their mental health even if they don't always realise it. Amber feels very left out at school and in an attempt to impress her friends she takes a joke too far and ends up creating and maintaining a Tinder profile for their teacher um, under the fake name of Kevin. And Kevin matches with Nikki and they start a internet friendship except that of course Kevin is not a man in his 30s it is Amber a 17 year old girl but both of these two people are very very lonely and they kind of bond but it is a friendship that is completely based on 
Amber's Lies. This is a very powerful novel. It is pretty raw and grim, like there are a lot of very dark themes in here, um, but it's a very powerfully written um, and is really really compelling like I read it very very quickly and I felt like both Amber and Nikki felt just very very believable so I definitely recommend this one really fantastic book this one's coming out in January then another book coming out in January is this this is Miss Austin Investigates by Jessica Bull and this is as it sounds like a cozy murder mystery in which Jane Austen is the detective um, so this book takes place when Jane Austen is like 19 or 20 years old um, and a young woman is murdered at a ball um, and Jane Austen decides that she's going to investigate. And when one of her brothers comes under suspicion for the crime, um, Jane is even more determined to find out who killed this woman and why she was killed. But Jane Austen, at 19 years old, brings to um, a murder investigation the same energy and wild imagination of Catherine Morland from Northanger Abbey, which means that um, she doesn't always get it right. I really, really enjoyed this. This is a fantastic, fun, really, really like wonderfully well thought out murder mystery and I feel like Jessica Bull just does Jane Austen and Jane Austen's family and friends so well like there are so many people in this book so many characters who I feel like I know from knowing about Jane Austen's life from reading her letters from reading biographies of her um and I just feel like they all felt as I imagined them to be, which I just thought was really, really wonderful. And I just loved all the like little Easter eggs in here for Jane Austen fans. But I also feel like Jessica Bull also managed really well to make this book a book that would be really enjoyable if you're reading it as a murder mystery without knowing a lot about Jane Austen's life. Um, like I feel like you would easily be able to follow who everyone is, how they relate to Jane Austen, and also all the kind of details of how society and like the legal system, the justice system worked at the time. I feel like they are really well explained to. And I just feel like Jessica Jessica Bull just found very clever ways to make everything really clear. So for example, there's a character list of um, Jane Austen's siblings at the beginning. And even just like the way the character list is written in Jane Austen's voice is just really fun. So for example, my favourite entry was for Mr. Edward Neddy Austen Knight. My favourite. For it's only prudent that one's wealthiest brother is one's favourite. Which is exactly what Jane Austen would have said. Very much entertained me. This was great. And then I also read this. This is The Bone Hunters by Joanne Byrne. And this one is set in 1824. And it follows Ada Winters, who is a amateur geologist, um, a fossil hunter. And she spends the majority of her time on the beaches, on the cliffs, searching for fossils that she can sell or collect um, and searching for bones of new dinosaurs, basically. However, her and her mother are kind of sinking into increasing poverty. Um, and because Ada is a woman, it's very hard for her to get any respect or any credibility as a geologist she has applied to be part of the geologist society and she's been rejected because of her gender um but at the beginning of this book she meets a man who is a geologist who's visiting Lyme for a few months um, and they begin to work together in order to try and uncover what she thinks may be a new type of dinosaur that she has discovered bones from and everything kind of goes on from there and we follow what happens as this partnership evolves this was a great book really well written really compelling um it reminded me quite a lot of like Elizabeth McNeil so I think if you like her writing I think you'll really like this too um and yeah this is just a great book another one I definitely recommend this one is coming out in February and it also read The Library Thief by Kachenga Shenje this book is set in the late Victorian period and follows young bookbinder Florence Granger who after her father has thrown her out of his house intercepts a letter from a client to her father asking for his library to be rebound and so Florence turns up on the doorstep of Lord Belfry's home Rose Hall and says I'm here to rebind your library please let me stay and so she ends up staying to rebind this library but she soon discovers that Rose Hall has a lot of secrets Lord Belfry is a widower his wife Persephone died in slightly mysterious circumstances and her lady's maid left in weird circumstances very soon afterwards as well there's only two servants in the house um, and Lord Belfry's brother is a very sinister character and everything kind of goes on from there we follow Florence as she tries to discover exactly what happened to Persephone but this book is one that kind of begins as a mystery but ends up being more of a coming of age story and, and the kind of mystery takes a little bit of a backseat as Florence and Florence's kind of like search for identity and belonging becomes more central to the book. This is a really interesting book and one that I really enjoyed so another book I would recommend. This is coming out in April 2024. Then another mysterious novel set in the Victorian period is this. This is The Beholders by Hester Musson um, and this book is set in the 1780s. We know right from the beginning of the book that um, a child has died 
died and that the child's mother has been accused of murdering this child. Um, we know this from the very beginning of the book in a newspaper article from June um, 1878 and then we flash back four months um, and read the diary of Harriet Watkins who is a housemaid so we know from the very beginning of the book that Harriet's mistress is going to be accused of murdering her own child later on in the novel and we follow Harriet as she gets to know her new mistress and as all the mysteries at Finton Hall kind of come to the surface I thought this book was so fantastic it was such a page turner such a thriller and I feel like the slow burn build and reveal of all the things that are going on at Finton Hall was just so well done um and the ending was just like perfect in this book. I feel like it was just really really well paced and if you like a you know Victorian set novel with an excellent mystery then The Beholders is really really for you. It felt very like Sarah Waters, Stacey Hall, Sarah Collins to me. Um, just very very powerful and kind of the way it picked apart like um, the surface of Victorian society versus what's underneath the surface of Victorian society was really done well. Actually both The Beholders and The Library Thief um, we're both kind of looking at that sort of like gap between the facade of Victorian society and all the rest of it um, in a way that I just really, really like it when books do. So yeah, I highly, highly recommend The Beholders out in January and a fantastic read. Then finally, for my 2024 proof copies, I also want to talk about this. This is The Theatre of Glass and Shadows, which is coming out in May by Anne Corlett, and this book is fantastic. I feel like I just need to tell you the setting of this book, and if this book is going to be one for you, then you will know. I feel like the blurb actually explains it really well, so I'm just going to read the very beginning of it. In an alternate London, the city's theatre district is a walled area south of the river where a lavish immersive production has been running for centuries. So this book is set in an alternative London in probably the 1950s and we follow a young woman called Juliet who, after her father's death, um, discovers some things which link her father to the theatre district and makes her think maybe her mother, who she never knew, might have come from there. And so she travels to the theatre district to try and work out whether or not she has anything to do with this place and everything kind of goes on from there but there are a lot of things that nobody knows about the theatre district and it is a mysterious place. This book is just fantastic, very immersive and imaginative and all the kind of like mysteries and reveals are like very very well plotted throughout the theatre of glass and shadows there's also throughout this book kind of like bits of historical source um kind of telling you about the history of the theatre district which i really really enjoyed and i feel like if you're someone who likes like Susanna clark bridget collins and that kind of like alternative history stuff then i feel like you will really really enjoy this um i just thought this was great fun and really really dramatic and very very cool so highly recommend this one too finally before i finish this video i have two short things to mention that I also read this month and I read those two things for my book club. As I think I've mentioned before, um, in my In Real Life book club we read a poetry collection, a short story and a play every month. The poetry was Christina Rossetti's poem, which I read in October for Victober, um, but I have my play and my short story to tell you about. Um, so the play was a play called Sex with a Stranger by Stefan Golosowski, which I didn't hugely love. Um, it does some interesting things with structure in that, like, the first half of the play is um, two people like on a bus going home together who have never met each other before um, and then the second half of the play looks at like the man's life in general and like his day leading up to the night but in general although I feel like the dialogue was strong and the structure was interesting it just kind of wasn't really a play for me and then the short story that we read was The Murders on the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe um, and I have read some Edgar Allan Poe short stories before but not for ages um, so it's really nice to read this I really enjoyed it um, well, maybe enjoy is the wrong word. It's quite a grim, uh, gory short story, but it basically looks at two unsolved murders um, and what happens when our narrator and his friend um, quite try to work out what happened. And the narrator's friend, Japan, is... Um, really like Sherlock Holmes and the dynamic between the narrator and him is very Watson and Sherlock Holmes and this was published like a good few decades before Sir Arthur Conan Doyle published um the first Sherlock Holmes story so I found that quite interesting definitely I feel like you see a lot of the seeds of Sherlock Holmes um in that character so yeah I'm looking forward to reading more short stories by Edgar Allan Poe in the future because I really enjoyed that one so there we go those are the 15 things that I read in November um do let me know down in the comments if you've read any of these books what you thought of them what was your highlight of November and also let me know if you're interested in picking up any of the 2024 new releases that I mentioned because they're really really great um, and I'm excited to see all of them published next year. I think that's all for now thanks so much for watching and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video. Mm -hmm.